Welcome to the Property Nomads podcast and delighted to have a corking episode for you. Loads of wonderful information. So you want to get your notepads out, unless you're driving, then don't get your notepad out. Uh, delighted to be joined by Shaz Nawaz. Shaz has a wealth of experience in property, accounting, tax planning. He's also the author of the wonderful book, Property Investors Tax Guide. For video purposes, you can just sit behind me there. For podcast purposes, go and check, definitely check that book out as well as Shaz taken Shaz has taken some time out of his busy schedule to join us today on the show so Shaz thank you very much thank you for having me uh, here Robert I'm delighted looking forward to this um before we sort of tuck into the meat and bones of it uh, just give a little bit of background about yourself because you run an accountancy firm of uh, and a tax firm as well so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into that field of work so I qualified that as an accountant, although uh, I was working in London for uh, different merchant banks, uh, and then uh, one day it dawned on me, Robert, uh, I should start my own accountancy firm. This is, uh, this is how these things work out, by the way. For some reason, generally speaking, somebody who qualifies as an accountant uh, at some point thinks they ought to have an accountancy firm. Just, uh, and the same applies to IFAs, lawyers dentists, doctors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I opened up my own accountancy firm back in 2003, which seems like a very long time ago. Uh, and ever since then, we've been growing and expanding. And kind of by chance, really, I started working with property investors. And I also started working with business owners who were pretty successful. Uh, so then I started uh, coaching and consulting. And as they became more successful, uh, most of them wanted a secondary income uh, and they pretty much all of them chose to go into property. So that kind of encouraged and forced me at the same time, Robert, to uh, learn more about property and property tax. Uh, but more importantly, it, it kind of encouraged me and inspired me to start investing in, in property myself. So that's pretty much uh, a very kind of short abbreviated synopsis of how I got to where I am today. That's fantastic. I, I love the adaption there uh, as well and, and going down that route and working, finding something that works for your clients and you know, vice versa, creating those win-win situations. I guess that, that just sounds like a natural progression there where one step leading to the next step leading to the next step and sort of fast forward to today where you've got the accountancy firm, you've got the tax firm as well and you're also doing some you know very good projects in the property world as well do you find that so jump into the first question about jvs then do you find that many people when they speak to you um they're a bit confused about setting up a correct joint venture structure uh, is that quite a common question you get it is uh, and it, uh, it's a, a broader question really Robert, because people are generally confused about the best structure to have for their business, because you, and I'm, I'm going to try and simplify it here. So you can have property in your own name. Some may call it a sole trader business, uh, although having property in your own name isn't a sole trader business per se, but for the purpose of this po podcast, let's assume it is. You can then have a, a kind of a standard ordinary partnership, husband, wife, uh, civil partners or, or in business with a friend or a colleague. You can then have a limited liability partnership. You can then have a limited company. You can then have kind of have a hybrid structure where let's say you've got uh, an LLP, limited liability partnership with a limited company. You can then have a holding company structure where you've got a limited company which owns a group of companies in which somebody has a stake or a share. So it's, as you can see, it's, it's kind of starts getting complicated then it depends on uh, what type of business you're in. So if you're doing service accommodation, possibly an LLP might be a good route to go to, to hold your assets and then have an operating company, which is a limited company. If you're doing JVs, it could be something different. If you're doing rent to rent, it could be something different. And you'll know from experience, Robert, when people get into property, one of the things that they learn pretty early on is to diversify within property. So don't, don't just do single lets. Maybe look at rent to rent, maybe look at deal sourcing, maybe look at commercial conversions, maybe look at new builds. So have a holistic strategy where, you, where you've got your risk diversified and not just in one type of property transaction. 
Uh, so it, it becomes very complicated. But then once people kind of get to understand that a bit better, they then enter into this world uh, called possibly no money down or using other people's money. And then they, then they also get to know that there are other people out there who are experts in certain types of property uh, strategies, or they realize, well, I've bought five properties over the last five years, for example, uh, and if I carry on like this, I've got another 10 years to go, I'm only going to be able to buy another 10 properties, for example. And they become very enthusiastic and they want a larger portfolio or they want to create more cash or they want to do something else. So they realize in order to grow or to get to whatever they want to get to, they now need to have joint venture partners. So now it's a conversation of, okay, if I have a, a JV, what ought that, what ought, what should that look like? And ought I have a limited company? Should I have one JV partner? Should I have different JV partners? What are the terms, the conditions, and uh, well, what type of a contract should I have? So it all starts getting very complicated. And obviously part of the conversation is to do with business structure, and part of it is obviously tax, and part of it is legal. So it is exceptionally complicated, to say the least. Which is exactly why we need to surround ourselves with professionals like yourself that are able to impart your knowledge to make things as efficient as possible. Is it, just hypothetically, let's just say someone has gone down the route of, they've gone, they've gone in by to let, they've put it under a limited company, very straightforward stuff. And then as you say, they decide to go and do building developments or commercial conversions. So they've just got one standalone limited company. They then might have a couple of joint venture partners um, that they might set up a couple of businesses with. Would you say that it's really at that point when those discussions are taking place that they would need to engage a tax specialist in order to get the most appropriate advice to make things efficient as possible? Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would say do that before you actually reach an agreement with whoever you're going into a JV with, because once you've agreed the terms, to then change them makes it very difficult. And where it gets really complicated, Robert, is you don't just need a tax specialist, you need a number of people, because obviously if you're doing buying commercial property with, with VAT, or you, you're doing new builds, then the VAT element's quite complicated. If you're doing service accommodation, and you're, you're looking after other people's uh, property, then the, the tour operator's margin scheme for VAT purposes may come in. So you've got that, and you've got, are you, are you zero rated? Are you standard rated? Are you, are you paying 5% VAT? Can you claim back the VAT? What other things can you do? On top of that, you then got stamp duty land tax, which is a specialist area. On top of that, then you've got, okay, capital allowances. So that becomes complicated. Then you've got your personal tax situation. So you, so you need a personal tax specialist. Then if you've got a, a limited company, you then need a, 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 a corporate tax specialist who knows about companies. So you need one more than one tax expert for the different type of taxes that are involved in property transactions. And uh, that makes perfect sense. And I would say to, because yeah, we've gone through this route, and uh, again, I'll point back to your book there, The Property Investor's Tax Guide. That's a, should give a lot of people a very good start. Um, I say I've read it a few times. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I took a lot of information away from there. In terms of then when to speak to a tax advisor, I'm just trying to get into people's heads, maybe people that haven't necessarily bought a property yet. Maybe they're thinking about getting into buy to let. It's okay like you know, to read a few books and get some information online and bits and bobs like that. But if, if someone's thinking about starting in property, starting to buy some buy to lets or commercials or whatever, again, it's, it's your advice. You need to speak to someone from the start because they might have things behind them, different tax positions that might affect the best way to sort of create a vehicle moving forward. I hope, I think I've just waffled that a little bit. Does that make any you sense? Have, you have, you uh, have, no, no, but it makes perfect sense. So to answer your question, I would say, if they are serious about property, and they are, let's say, uh, Jane Smith works as an employee somewhere. She works for Leicester Fed Chamber, HSBC Bank. Uh, and she's been there for 15 years. She now decides 
that uh, she wants a different life diet and let's say she has a family, uh, a husband or, or a wife, let's say she possibly has a couple of children. So she, she wants to spend more time with the family, wants to go, go traveling and feels that a, 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 a full nine to five job, which never is nine to five, by the way, it, it, it's usually seven days a week, you know what I mean? Uh, it isn't right for her and she wants to get into property and wants to leave her full-time job and have a property business, then for someone like that, I would strongly suggest, Robert, that they actually go to a property specialist from day one. If somebody has a business, for example, or works full-time and has one or two properties and will only have one or two properties because that's, that, that's all they want, then they don't have to go to a specialist property tax accountant. If they do, it's good for them because they'll learn more things, hopefully they'll be inspired, they'll see things differently and they may want to create more or, or, or a, a larger or a bigger or, or a better portfolio. But if they're very clear and, uh, uh, that they only want two or three vital properties, then perhaps they don't need to go to a, a specialist property tax accountant. But on the whole, most people who go into property generally tend to grow and expand their portfolio. So for those people, as long as they've got that clarity on day one, Robert, I would say go to a specialist property tax accountant from day one. Because the problem is, using your earlier example, somebody buys vital properties and they've bought four or five already in a, in a limited company. And then they realize that was the wrong structure for them. Then to fix that, it becomes very costly because you, 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 you appreciate you've got potential capital gains tax implications possibly income tax implications, depending on the type of property strategy they're working on. You've got stamp duty land tax uh, implications. You've, you've then, you, you may have mortgages, so you need to re repay those mortgages. There, there may be early penalties for repaying the mortgage. On top of that, then you may have some inheritance tax consequences. So it's, it, start become, it's, it starts becoming very complex, complicated, and extremely expensive. Then to change the structure, probably isn't worthwhile because when you add up all the taxes, for example, I'm just making this number up for the uh -huh. purpose of this conversation. It could be that it's going to cost you 50 grand in taxes to change the structure plus 10 grand fees to pay your, your tax advisor. Whereas if you'd, if you'd been to see somebody from the start and shared your goals, aims, aspirations, objectives with them, and you've got the right structure, well, you've saved all that cost and you've got peace of mind and you've got a structure which is future proof based on your own goals, aims, ambitions, aspirations, objectives. So it's, it's critical to get the right expert from day one where possible. And just to put the cherry on top there, with people that are starting, there's a mentality aspect as well, because some people might look at having a chat of a tax planner, a tax planner says, yeah, you know, we can sit down for half hour or whatever, and it's like 500 pounds, hypothetically. And some people might go, well, why would I want to do that? But the point that you make, and I agree with you, is that by having that chat, making that investment at the start, and you could save thousands and thousands of pounds moving forward by that upfront investment. Um, I'm sure, have you found that when you speak to people um, that they, you've, you've got to try and convince them to have a mental shift or are most of your clients of, of that mindset where, you know, they're, they're there to rely on, on you and they appreciate that it's an investment, not a cost per se. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of uh, the first point that you make, see, property isn't cheap. So let's just take a basic example and talk about someone, let's say, in the Northeast who's buying properties for £60,000 each and they've got 10 properties. Well, they've got a £600,000 portfolio. Uh, or if they're looking to build a portfolio of that size, then paying £500 or £1,000 or even £5,000 to start off with, by the way, to set the right uh, structure, I think is a very good investment. Now, some or listen to this podcast, will say, well, Shaz is bound to say that he's an accountant, so he's going to be biased. Well, yes, but because very quickly, over 5, 10, 15, 20 years time, the value of the portfolio is going to increase. And at that time, if you found out you had a ticking time bomb and you've created something which is going to be very costly for you tax-wise, well, then you were better off spending the 500 or 1,000 pounds to start off with to save that problem. The second part 
which is important, is most people go to an advisor, be it an accountant, a solicitor, IFA, or somebody else, and they expect them to obviously look after their best interests, which is absolutely right, and they expect them to obviously help and guide them, which again is right. But something which is extremely important, and at the same time, it also frustrates me as it does anybody else, is even though you have an accountant or a solicitor or somebody else who, who's an expert, you still ought to spend some time, Robert, in learning about that particular area so you have a good basic grasp of how things work. Uh, and quite often I have people speaking to me saying, I always have to go to my accountant and prompt them with something. For example, can I claim travel? Can I, can I have a company car? Should I be making pension contributions? Can I add my children to the company? So on and so forth. And they have to prompt that conversation with their accountant because the accountant, in their eyes, failed to have that conversation with them. Uh, and, and the way to overcome that is to, to make sure that you pay your accountant a bit extra and say, can we have one, two, three, four review meetings, depending on the size of the business, on a regular basis? So the accountant sits with you on a regular basis, depending on the size of your business, and you have those conversations in a proactive manner, as opposed to seeing your accountant once a year, where you give them your books and records, and then they prepare the accounts, and then you're not going to get much advice. In order to get advice, you need to be you need to have an intimate fund, understanding and relationship with your accountant or your advisor, and that means talking to them on a regular basis. And unfortunately, that comes with the cost. But the benefit and the value should always far outweigh the cost, uh, in my experience, Robert. I would concur 100%. It's imperative to think of things like that as an investment. Uh, again, I'm just going to sort of make up numbers as go along here. You know, but let's just say you've got a small portfolio and you make a, on paper, you make, you know, £20,000 profit for the year. Congratulations, well done. Well, you then, if you haven't thought about it properly, you're then probably going to get hit, I guess, with the corporation tax bill at some point. But then, as you would probably sit there and agree with, that if you were to have had a chat with accountant or, you know, tax advisor or both, then you know you might find that twenty thousand pound could have been, I say written off. It's probably not the right terminology, but you know an expense here, something there where you could have made a contribution here, and then therefore you've you don't have a, a tax bill to pay. Um, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head, so well worth that investment. Um, it goes a bit wider. Uh, okay, if I could, add, and you're you're absolutely right. Having those conversations enables you to then. Uh, save tax, but also think, look at your business holistically. So uh, I also run mastermind groups. And last week, one of the mastermind attendees was paying £550,000 to buy a pub. And then he was going to obtain planning permission to build flats on the, on the first floor, and the ground floor was going to remain commercial. So as we talked through the numbers, and as you kind of kindly shared at the start in terms of my uh, introduction, I also invested in property and we very quickly worked out that paying 550 for that particular uh, pub in that particular location with the, the potential to create flats, that property wasn't worth 550. The maximum it was worth based on numbers alone was 400 grand. So then, so then I said to him, and you stop here, go back and speak to the vendor and say, it's not worth 550. And by the way, uh, how, how long has this been on sale for? And he said, this property has been on the market for two years and hasn't sold. And the person, and the person selling it had it on the market, I think, for 595. This guy has gone in, doesn't have experience of doing commercial conversions and thought getting like a, 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 a 10% discount it isn't quite 10 percent, but that's what a 10 percent discount was a good price to pay. But having worked the numbers, we so soon established it wasn't worth more than 400 grand. So he's now going back to have that conversation with the vendor and saying, You've had the property in the market for two years. The reason why it hasn't sold, the numbers don't stack up. I know I offered 550, I just can't make it work. I won't get the bank funding. And once I get the planning, if I get the planning, if I then convert it, the deal doesn't add up. 
so this guy potentially saved 150,000 pounds by talking to a specialist who knows how property works. So the, the savings are ginormous. And of course, not every time can we find those types of savings. So the, the savings can be huge and significant, not just in terms of tax, but the added value in terms of how to make property deals work. And that's just a great example of why it's imperative to have that, that peer group. Uh, as you've just highlighted there by a potential £150,000 saving on, on a property purchase. Uh, Shazi, in terms of um, in terms of tax savings or tax, you know, efficient tax strategies, are you able to go, if you're allowed to, are you able to go through a couple of examples in ways that you've helped people with their with their tax planning, if you're able to deep dive into a couple of them, just so people get an idea of sorts of things that might be available? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll just run to through two or three that, that come to mind straight away. So quite often, uh, because I do commercial conversions, Robert, I end up attracting people who are doing commercial conversions because they, they, they see the added value and an advantage of using an accountant who understands how that particular strategy works, but also is doing it themselves, which makes perfect sense. Uh, and just right now, in fact, I'm working on, I think, at least five capital allowance claims for people who are buying commercial property. And quite often people miss out on this. So if anybody listening or watching this uh, interview is about to or is going to buy a commercial property, then they ought to make sure that they speak to their solicitor, but also a, a specialist like myself and say, can I claim any capital allowances when I'm purchasing a building which has plant and machinery, fixtures and fittings as part of the building? Uh, and the uh, the, the value of that claim obviously depends on what's inside a building, but the savings are significant. So one of the claims I'm looking at right now, by the way, uh, Robert, is about £180,000. Another one is about £230,000. And a couple uh, are, are smaller. And, and, and the fifth ones are a lot bigger because it, it's, a, it's a much bigger property. So you've got that. Very often, and, and the, the stamp duty land tax, there are potential savings. Uh, so we file about four to six claims every single year, uh, every single year, sorry, every single month for people who've overpaid stamp duty land tax in the last 12 months. On top of that, we help people structure uh, their affairs and for, for stamp duty land tax so that, that they can minimize their SDLT. Let me give you a couple of very quick, quick examples. Somebody's buying six or more properties as a small portfolio at the same time. So they've got, they've got uh, three options. They can pay SDLT on the transaction per property. They can pay SDLT on based on non-residential rates, or they can claim multiple dwellings relief. So we work out which one gives them the best scenario, and we use that. Just recently, and we had this quite often, we had a, a client, and they were buying a new home for themselves, looking to sell their existing home, but the new home that they were buying had a granny annex. So this was a separate building, separate entrance, separate kitchen, bathroom, bedroom. Uh, so we worked out for them that they qualified for multiple dwellings relief and reduced their stamp duty land tax bill by 15,000 pounds. Those are two examples for you. Uh, above and beyond that, sometimes, People are buying property which is which has some form of contamination, Japanese knotweed, asbestos, and etc. So we can claim land remediation relief for them. So there are quite a few different things that we end up claiming for clients simply because we do this day in, day out for property investors. Uh, of course, I do this for myself. So I have a I have more experience than most property accountants in terms of the different things people ought to be doing. And uh, as I said earlier, without laboring the point, uh, hopefully I can bring the extra value, not just in terms of tax and business structure, but how to make a deal stack up and how to make it worth, not just purely from uh, a purchase price, but once you've bought it, okay, how can we now add more value to this whole thing uh, so, so we can make the transac transaction as profitable for you as as we can 
but also at the same time make it as efficient for you as we can, depending on whether you're going to keep it or whether you're going to sell it. Always start with the exit in mind as well, because then that will possibly help you to put it in the right vehicle, have the right strategy if your exit's X, Y and Z, basically. Extremely important. Yeah. Just quickly going back onto land remediation, relief, because I, I've never used it. I had to use it, but that's my favourite thing of all time. Uh, it, if I'm not mistaken, don't you get 150% back? Yep, you got it. That's right. It's a very good relief. Uh, yeah, I, just, um, I urge people to go and Google it because it's fantastic. Um, Shaz, a bit of a sort of a quirky question here. Uh, do you have any particular favourite relief of yours? By far, my most favourite is stamp duty land tax. And the reason why I say that, Robert, is the one that's least understood by accountants and tax people. And it's the one that's least understood by lawyers. So although when you go to a solicitor, they will complete just your STLT return within 14 days and, and file it with HMRC. They don't have a good grasp of how SDLT works. Now, I'm not talking about the larger firms here and the magic circle, by the way, because they've got specialists who can do this. I'm talking about the types of firms you, me and other people use who are on the high street. Very good firms, by the, by, by the way. Very good conveyances. They'll give you a clean title. or They'll, they'll make sure you, you're buying a clean title and they'll work everything else out. But the SDLT piece is the missing piece. And I mean, I've, I've, and now we've done so many cases for SDLT. Uh, uh, we had someone approach us last week, a, a low, low firm from London, who said, we're getting a lot of interest in SDLT. We want to outsource all the SD, uh, SDLT work to your firm uh, because it's a specialist area. So SDLT is my favorite because we can find immediate savings depending on the situation and circumstances. And that there's either a, a cash saving to be had by paying less SDLT or somebody's overpaid SDLT in, in the last 12 months and we can get them money back. So that's my favorite because it, it, is, it is very complicated, the least understood, but there's a lot of opportunity in SDLT in terms of savings. Thanks for the in-depth ex explanation. Sounds sounds good to me. Uh, one question that's just sort of sprung in my mind before we start to slowly wrap up is uh, just going back to capital allowances. It, can you claim capital allowances if you buy a block of residential flats? Does that qualify as commercial or am I being a bit of a choose there? So if, if you're buying a block, uh, a, a block of flats, you can't you can't claim capital allowances on the residential element, but for the kind of common areas, you can claim capital allowances for those areas only. So, so the claim is going to be a lot smaller than if you were claiming for the entire building as a commercial property. Capital allowances work extremely well where somebody's running a, a serviced accommodation business because you when you buy a property, let's assume it's a, a commercial property, you, you may be able to claim capital allowances when you buy the property, then you refurbish it into service accommodation, then you've got a second lot of capital allowances for that element, so, so you end up having a significant, you could end up having a significant amount of capital allowances uh, for your SA business. That's where it really kind of comes to life. Good to know. Um, SA is not something I, I, I dabble in uh, or, or do, but so that's, that's really good to know. So for people listening at do SA, take heed of that. But the last question I have, like, I've just written down as we're looking at my notes, is um, apart from people not speaking to the council tax advisors, you know, early enough in, in their property investments, are there any common mistakes that you see people making that we haven't already discussed on this podcast? So... The first one, which is the most dangerous, is, and I'm sure you've heard before, and I'm sure your listeners have heard before, is the most, so having a bit of knowledge is probably the worst thing, because then you, you, you may be tempted in your mind to think you know how something works. So all too often, people end up Googling information, thinking they understand how something works, implementing it, and then later on finding out HMRC are looking into that transaction and they've, they've, they've done something wrong. 
so when it comes to tax, just like most other things, do not do a DIY job. So don't do it on your own. Uh, that, that's the first one. The second one is, I think too often, the, the, the fantastic thing about property investors compared to any other sector, by the way, Robert, is I think property investors are more enthusiastic. They have a positive mindset. They are kind of go-getters. They want to make stuff happen. They really do. They're very ambitious compared to any other sector that I've, uh, I've worked with, which is fantastic. I think where they fall short sometimes is that they sometimes try and do stuff themselves. So too often, they, they try and keep the bookkeeping in-house and spend five hours a week doing the bookkeeping themselves. Or, or they'll do the payroll in-house or they'll do the CIS, the construction industry scheme returns themselves or, or the VET returns themselves. And I think they ought to let go of that compliant stuff and give it to an accountant or somebody else, free their time and let the specialists and the experts do that. And they can use their time doing more valuable stuff. I think people struggle to make that transition. And I know it might cost them less. Let's just give an example of it might cost them 200 pounds extra a month okay, to give everything away to a, a, an accountant or, or, or a bookkeeper. But once they've done that, they've freed up time. There's less mistakes to be made. The bookkeeper, accountant, who tax advisor will, will do everything properly for them, will give them advice, will, will save them money. So I think letting go of stuff is extremely important as well. So those two are the common things that I come across day in, day out on a regular basis uh, that, that people do all too often. The third one is they don't spend the time to work with the right type of uh, advisor. So I, I, I'll give you an example from myself. So because I do different types of property transactions, I use different lawyers for different jobs. So mm -hmm. Some are good at leases, some are good at commercial property, some are good at buying residential portfolios, some are good at contracts or commercial law. So I've got three or four firms that I use depending on the type of transaction I'm entering. Uh, and I, I think that's extremely important. And I've, I've taken time to research, get recommendations for people who are really good. I think when people go into property, they ought to spend time finding the right accountant who gets on well with them, they understand them and vice versa. But, that, but to make sure that the accountant specializes in the property strategy that this person is looking to go into or the strategy that they are using. I think people don't spend enough time researching, talking to, and finding the right type of advisor. Brilliant. I appreciate that, Shaz. And again, you know, take heed of all that information that you've just portrayed. It's, it's invaluable. You're saying it for a reason. You are where you are because, you know, you've, taking you're taking that advice and, and you're doing it so yeah i can all i can say to other people and myself and Robert, as well, um, listen my friend I, i've been at this in this business for 19 years i've been doing property for a long time we're building 49 houses in, in boston right now after that I've got, I've, got, I've got a commercial conversion lined up uh so i'm 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 pretty busy in property i'm learning stuff every single day there's a lot of things i don't know where i have to go to experts or people like yourself in terms of your book and your podcast and elsewhere where i'm i'm picking things up so we're all learning all the time uh and uh that's a good thing by the way but with learning i think it's also important that that, that we have the right power team and, uh, and the right experts around us so it, it gives us the confidence to to do and achieve what we want to do and achieve yeah, hundred percent. Totally, totally agree. I couldn't have said that better myself. So I'm not going to waffle on top of what you've just said. Cause it's very poignant advice. Uh, Shaz, uh, massive thank you for your time. Really appreciate that. If people want to find out more about yourself, your products, your services, where can people find you? So two, or th two, or three things. They, they can go on Amazon. I've, I've got the property investors tax guide there. I, I've also got some books on entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and business. They can go onto my website in trustpropertytaxexperts.co.uk. If they're on Facebook, they can join my Facebook group, which is in Trust Property Tax Experts. If they're on YouTube, they type in my name, Shaz Nawaz. I've got loads of videos there sharing uh, information on property and property tax, but also uh, 
I like to record videos of, of, of my own property journey where I can share with property with people where I've bought a commercial property, for example, and then I've converted it. So I share the, the goods, the, the bad, the ebbs and the flows, the positive and, uh, and the negatives of how a particular transaction went. And all of that is free online. Uh, so I urge and encourage all of your listeners and viewers to look at that information. Once they've seen that, if they've got any questions, post it on social media. I answer every single question personally myself. I might not answer it on the same day, Robert, but within <laughs> three or four days, I do try and get around to answering every single person's question. Oh, wonderful stuff. And as usual, we will put all those links into the show notes. Uh, Shaz, no, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, any final parting words, any any uh, extra words of wisdom before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I think the, the parting words really are uh, that uh whenever you're doing something make sure you speak to people who are doing that thing day in day out so they can help and guide and, and uh, advise you so that you can achieve your objectives quicker than you ought to otherwise I, and i say that rob but through my own hard experiences so i've done a lot of property transactions some of them by the way haven't gone to plan and have cost me a lot of money. And when I look back at why I made certain mistakes, more often than not, I failed to reach out to people to seek advice, even though those people were around me, were known to me for some reason. I, got, I tried to shortcut things and try to speed things up, and I made mistakes. So always reach out to people. Don't be afraid to ask for advice. The people around you are more than happy to help you. And the more help and advice you get, the quicker and better you'll be at doing what you do. Oh, wonderful stuff. Shaz, really thank you very much. It's been great. It's an action-packed episode. Loads of great content there. Pleasure. All the best on your deals. Thank you for having me uh, and take care, my friend.